The story you're about to hear is about a woman, a man, and what God did to bring them together. I'll let you draw your own conclusions about what I consider is the greatest story ever told. Let us hear now from David Suchet as he tells us the backstory of the woman from the YouVersion Bible. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. And now we hear from David Suchet as he tells us the back story of the man from the U Version Bible. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. And we hear once again from David Suchet as he tells us the climax of the story from the U Version Bible. In those days, Caesar Augustus, issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. 
Today, in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And now, friend, before you draw any conclusions, allow me to share with you a few of mine. Firstly, when Jesus Christ was born, it wasn't just another baby coming into the world. Rather, in that moment, God took on human flesh to redeem all humanity. You may wonder, why did God, after all that planning, have Mary and Joseph leave Nazareth and go to Bethlehem? Why did he allow our Saviour to be born in a lowly manger? Why did he come as a baby and not in some other more magnificent and more powerful form? Well, friend, I want you to remember this. God was working everything together for his glory. Therefore, when Caesar Augustus decreed that everyone must return to the city of their birth for a census, God had a purpose in it. Specifically, he was fulfilling a promise made hundreds of years earlier in Micah 5 verse 2. Bethlehem, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. Of course, you may still believe that there must have been some problem because Mary and Joseph couldn't find a place to stay. After all, the Son of God should have been born in a palace rather than in a stable, right? Yet Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We see that in John 1.29. The Lord wanted his perfect Lamb to be born where other lambs were also. And then also in Hebrews 2.14, it tells us, Since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. And so therefore Jesus came as a baby so that he could identify with the weakest among us and be like us in every way. However, do not think that for one moment God's glory was absent from that scene. From other texts we learn that he even aligned the stars to proclaim the joyful coming of the Saviour. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we read, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Secondly, in Galatians 4, verse 4, Paul tells us, when the fullness of time came, God sent his Son. This means that in his greatest wisdom, God knew the perfect moment to send his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. We have needed someone to redeem us ever since Adam and Eve disobeyed God and fell in sin in the Garden of Eden. Romans 5.12 tells us, Sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin. And this way, death came to all men because all have sinned. 
humanity was condemned to be separated from God for eternity because everyone since Adam has been born with the sin nature within them. And because the Lord is holy, he does not tolerate sin. And yet God knew that we couldn't save ourselves. So he looked down from heaven and he chose a godly man, and we know him as Abraham, to work through him and he set his plan in motion. He promised Abraham in Genesis 22:18, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Abraham fathered Isaac, who in turn had the twins Jacob and Esau. And from Jacob came twelve sons, who would then become the patriarchs of the twelve tribes of Israel. The history is long and instructive. God worked through his people powerfully, and he saved them countless times from many enemies. He even taught them how to serve him and what sacrifices would be necessary when they repented of their sin. And yet when the people turned away from God and gave in to their wickedness, they suffered greatly, even facing capture and bondage in Egypt and captivity in Babylon. Although Israel prayed for the Messiah to come during those terrible times, God waited until the world was ready to receive his son, when the message of the gospel could be carried to the ends of the earth. This came after Alexander the Great spread the Greek culture and the Greek language throughout the known world, creating a common tongue for people to communicate in. It also happened after the Romans had created extensive roadways connecting the nations and making the roads and the seas safe for travel. All these events had to take place so that not only would Israel be saved, but the whole world could know the Saviour. Of course, each part of God's plan took hundreds of years, and you may wonder, why did he take so long? It's because God knew exactly what he wanted to accomplish. He wanted us to see his mighty work throughout all of history and the fulfillment of his promises to Abraham and all his people. He also wanted us to understand that serving him through sacrifices will never be enough because we will always fall short. You see, only he can save us. And what we must do is to believe in him and consequently obey him. Thirdly, further in Galatians 4, 4 and 5, we see that not only did Christ come in the fullness of time, but he was also born of a woman, born under law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. You may be wondering now, why is it important to note that Jesus was born of a woman rather than of a man and a woman? Friend, the virgin birth is an imperative factor of God's plan, and it represents the victory and the triumph of Christ's being born into the world. Recall that everyone since Adam has been born sinful because we inherit the nature of our Father. Yet Jesus was not conceived through an earthly father. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. That means he never received the sinful nature of a father. He is sinless, which means he is the only one who could ever be the unblemished sacrifice for our sins. Jesus' wonderful, miraculous birth and his sacrificial death made it possible for us then to be acceptable in the eyes of God. And that's why the angels in heaven sang out, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased, in Luke 2.14. 
That baby Jesus was born in a manger to pay the ultimate price and did what we could not so that we could be reconciled to the Father. Now, surely that's a victory worthy of praise. And so my conclusion is this. If everyone understood what happened on the night that Jesus was born, instead of warring against him, people would be humbling themselves before him and worshipping his name. Unfortunately, many people still regard the story of a saviour born in a manger as a quaint fairy tale, a legend, or even a religious myth. They don't appreciate the amazing work of God that took place. At the beginning of this message, I asked you to listen to the story of a woman, a man, and what God did to bring them together. So when you think about the story of that first Christmas so long ago, what is your conclusion? Do you consider it to be the greatest story ever told, or merely a legend shared by a nomadic people around evening campfires? Friend, Jesus said, The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Luke 19 verse 10 he came at the perfect moment to take on an extraordinarily humble mission to triumph over the worst of our enemies, sin and death. So let me ask you two questions. Has Jesus made an appearance in your life? And have you opened your heart to the sinless Savior? You either believe in him or you do not. I can assure you with every fiber of my being that when you place your trust in Him, He saves you. He reconciles you to the Father and He promises to stay with you forever. However, when you reject Him, you reject the loving, merciful plan that God has established throughout the history of the world. Jesus Christ has already done the miraculous on your behalf through the most significant events of human history, his wonderful birth and his sacrificial death. Therefore, you can accept him as your personal savior. He's willing to forgive you, cleanse you, and show you his amazing love. And that is the reason why I say the Christmas story is certainly the greatest story that has ever been told. Amen.